chapter 7 is a very important passage because it contains a summary of Israel's history with reference to the accusations which are being brought against Christianity. And it's not an easy sermon to organize. It's not all that easy to see exactly what Stephen is doing in chapter 7. But basically the sermon has four parts. Stephen talks about Abraham. And then he talks about Joseph. Stephen is really the only one in the New Testament who talks about Joseph. I think that Joseph is the greatest way to prove in the Old Testament that Jesus of Nazareth is the Son of God. But nobody ever uses Joseph to do that. Stephen uses Joseph in a somewhat different way. He, first he talks about Abraham. Then he talks about Joseph. Then he talks about Moses. Then he talks about David and Solomon. Now, it's very easy to understand why he talks about Abraham and Joseph and Moses. What the Jewish leaders are claiming is that God only shows himself through the temple. God only blesses us through the temple. God only manifests his presence through the temple. We have to have the temple to know the presence of God, the will of God, the blessing of God. Well, Stephen says, obviously that's not true because God appeared to Abraham in Mesopotamia, in Haran, when he was an idolater. God didn't use a temple to reveal himself to Abraham. God revealed himself to Moses in Midian when he was the son-in-law and shepherd for a priest, not a priest of Israel and not through a temple of Israel. Excuse me, I skipped Joseph. God blessed Joseph in Egypt. God used Joseph in Egypt and made him a redeemer in Egypt with no reference to any temple. And so he, um, he takes them through a survey of Israel's history. Um, it says in verse 9 about Joseph that God was with him. That had nothing to do with any temple. He talks about the way God preserved Moses in Egypt. And then finally he does talk about the era in which the temple was established. You know, it was David who captured Jerusalem, which had been the Jebusite capital after David ruled Israel for seven years. He took Jerusalem. He wanted to build a house for the Lord. It bothered him that he lived in a real house of wood but God was worshipped in a tent in Israel. He wanted to set that right. He was not allowed to set that right, but his son was allowed to set that right. Solomon built the temple, and yet um, Solomon says in 1 Kings 7 that no temple could contain God, that God inhabits the whole universe. And at this point, when, when Stephen talks about Solomon, he quotes from Isaiah 66. This is Acts 7, verse 49, quoting from Isaiah 66. Heaven is my throne, earth is my footstool. What kind of house will you build for me? Was it m not my hand which made all these things? And so the, the point that, that Stephen is making is that, yes, you do control the temple, but God is not restricted to the temple. And if we look in the, at the history of our people, God blesses people outside the temple. God appears to people far from the temple. And this has even been true since a temple has been built. So he makes that, he makes that point. But, you know... Um, Beginning in verse 51, something amazing happens. Stephen insults them, and they kill him. Now, we have to ask ourselves the question, why did he do that? And the answer is because he was filled with the Holy Spirit. That wasn't Stephen's decision. That was God's decision. 
In other words, he didn't just give them a little survey of the Old Testament. He said, you know, you've heard the truth. You know this truth. But your fathers persecuted those who preached the truth. Your fathers stoned the prophets, and you're just like them. Yes, you can be proud of yourself for being circumcised, but the reality is your heart is not circumcised. Your spirit is not circumcised. Your understanding is not circumcised. Yes, you're a Jew outwardly, but inwardly you're resisting God, and you killed the righteous one. You are his murderers. Well, yes, the law came to you, but you didn't keep the law. You killed the Holy One. Well, verse 54 says that when they, when they heard that, they lost control. They lost their temper. And they rushed, rushed at him to kill him. Now, through chapter 7, Stephen bears witness to Christ before men. Just before he dies, at the end of chapter 7, Stephen is given a vision of heaven. On earth, Stephen has been bearing witness to Christ, of Christ, among men. Stephen gets a vision in heaven of Christ bearing witness to him before God. At the end of chapter 6, we're told that Stephen looks like an angel. At the end of chapter 7, we're told that Stephen is allowed to look into the place where the angels are. And he has a vision of Christ. And the reason this vision is so um, significant is that Christ is standing up. And we know that in heaven, Christ is seated at the right hand of God. But verse 56, Stephen says, I see the heavens opened up and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. So first, Stephen was given grace to be a servant. Secondly, he was given grace to work great miracles. Third, he was given grace to preach a mighty sermon in the presence of the enemies of God. Fourth, he was given the grace to have a vision of heaven. And fifth, he was given the grace to die a faithful death. You know, I think as we look at a passage like this, we have to ask ourselves the question, where do we start? We would like to have a glorious ending, but you don't begin with the ending. You begin at the beginning. And you see, when you choose the beginning of a road, you also choose the end of the road. You can't see the end yet. You can only see the road at its, at its beginning. But if you, if you choose a certain road, it leads to a certain place. 1 Samuel 17 contains one of the most famous stories in the history of the world. It's the story of David and his introduction to Israel publicly. 1 Samuel 17 is the story of David's de defeating Goliath. But when, when that story begins, David is not trying to do anything dramatic. David is not trying to do anything heroic. David is not trying to do anything glorious. David is not doing anything that he thinks will make himself famous. David is doing a little simple job of service given to him by his father, who said, take this bread and take this cheese to your brothers and to their commander. Can you imagine uh, being asked later in life, David, what did you do in the war? Well, I, I carried the cheese. It wasn't very heroic, was it? It wasn't something to brag about. It wasn't something to be proud of. He was just trying to do the simple will of his father. Well, how does the story of Stephen begin? With a vision of heaven? With a glorious martyr's death? No. Stephen, will you serve these widows? Will you make sure 
that each person gets what he's supposed to do. Will you take this low job? You know, it's going to be a difficult job because these women are fighting with each other. And they might fight with you if you don't divide the food, divide the food like they want the food divided. So in a very, very short time, we go from a man who has this low job of serving at, at table to a man who has a vision of heaven and a man who dies a glorious death as the first martyr. They stone him. They kill him. And he dies like Christ dies. Now here we see an amazing contrast, an amazing contrast. Look at what he says in verses 51 to 53. Acts 7, 51. You men who are stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears are always resisting the Holy Spirit. You are doing just as your fathers did. Which one of the prophets were not persecuted by your fathers? They kill those who announce the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered the righteous one. You received the law, but you didn't keep it. That's what he says in verses 51 to 53. But look at what he says in verse 60. Lord, do not hold this sin against them. Do not hold the sin against them. Amazing. The gospel is a two-edged sword. The gospel can wound, and the gospel can also heal. The gospel can slay, and the gospel can make alive. In verses 51 through 53, he speaks a word of condemnation. In verse 60, he speaks a word of conciliation, a word of forgiveness. In verses 51 through 53, he pronounces guilt. In verse 60, he pleads for mercy. Both are part of the gospel. You see, we have to understand how really, really sinful we are so that salvation becomes necessary. If we do not accurately assess the gravity of sin, the seriousness of sin, the horror of sin, then we will never appreciate the necessity of a Savior. If we're not very bad, why should a perfect sacrifice have to die? Why should God's own Son have to die if our sin problem is not really big? You see, the gospel stings, but it also sings. The gospel wounds, but it also heals. The gospel offers us condemnation for who we are without Christ, but salvation for who we become with Christ. And so it's really not a contradiction what Stephen is doing here. And Stephen is not doing it. Stephen is full of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit is leading him to preach these words. This is the longest sermon in the book of Acts. Even a small contribution can make a big difference. Jesus fed over 5,000 people because of a little boy's five loaves. Regardless of the amounts, your contribution is very important and greatly appreciated. Visit us at www.tvseminary.com. Let me draw a lesson from the Gospels and from the book of Acts, and let me draw a lesson from church history. Don't ever think that faithfulness will bring you rewards in this life. It won't. Faithfulness will get you killed. Faithfulness will bring a reward, but not in this life. The reward will come from God, and the reward will, will last forever. You see, you and I have to make up our mind, who do we want to reward us? And how long do we want the reward to last? 
we have the phenomenon in America of very, very, very wealthy athletes and they get millions and millions of, do of dollars a year. Some of them are boxers. Some of them are football players, American football. Some of them are basketball players. And they make five and 10 and $15 million a year. We have another phenomenon, a very, 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 very high percentage of those athletes are bankrupt within 10 years of their retirement. They're homeless. They don't have anything. It's amazing. I can name athletes like this. A boxer named Mike Tyson, a basketball player named Antoine Walker, who used to make $11 million a year. Now he's in debt, millions of dollars in debt, doesn't have anything. Michael Jackson was millions of dollars in debt when he died. Here's the first question. Who do you want to reward you? And how long do you want to keep your reward? The only reward for faithfulness in this life on this planet is suffering and death. But there is a reward which awaits. And Stephen saw the reward before he died. He had a vision of Christ standing, waiting to receive him. You know, if we ever have a vision like that, not that we will or not that we should seek it, but if we do, it will be enough. And when we see Christ, it will be enough. And if we gain the whole world by refusing to confess Christ, it won't be enough. It won't satisfy us. It cannot. Only Christ can satisfy our soul. Stephen died a martyr. Stephen died in pain, but Stephen died satisfied. The beginning of the road is faithful service. The end of the road is a faithful death. We, we may not have much control over what happens in between. We may not work mighty miracles, and we might not preach a great sermon, and we might not see a great vision. But I believe we can be faithful to serve others, and I believe we can be faithful in death. I believe the Lord will give us that opportunity. Now he who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will also supply and increase your store of seed and will enlarge the harvest of your righteousness. You will be enriched in every way so that you can be generous on every occasion. And through us, your generosity will result in thanksgiving to God. 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 10, 11. How to give to TVS Ministry. You may give online at efta.org slash give now. In the description place, write Russia Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Or make checks out to EFCA. Write on the check memo line, Russian Distance Learning, account number 24109-0150. Mail to EFCA Donor Services, 901 East 78th Street, Minneapolis, Minnesota, 55420-1300 or send your gift through PayPal for tvs.gift at gmail.com.